Well, good evening. Welcome to Sunday night. And uh, this is something we like to do about once a quarter, is just have a Q&A. And uh, this is not a game show called Stump the Pastor. Right? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is designed to just let us hear what's on your heart, uh, the thoughts and questions you have, and uh, give John the opportunity to field the, the answers. So um, actually what I want to do this evening is uh, just start us off a little bit. John, I'd like to follow up from this morning. Um, and, and you were you were in Mark four, and just talking about um, guarding our listening. And I wanted to ask you, knowing the difficulty of spiritual listening uh, for yourself and for all your hearers, how do you prepare for Sundays, knowing that what has to happen is supernatural, and that we are who we are, um, with with all the things that go on in our own hearts that that create difficulty for spiritual hearing. Um, what are you praying for? for yourself, and for all of us as we gather on Sunday mornings. Well, yeah, I mentioned a little bit about kind of the occupational hazard of studying the Bible, and, and then uh, you guys would experience that, you know, just as you study it for yourself, there's a challenge. There, there's so many things that you can really devote your attention to and, um, and get distracted um, from, from the, the actual obligation of obedience, and so... What you know when I'm when I'm, I'm diving into a new text and you know I started the, uh, the new week there's there is a routine to my week so there's there's a little bit of um, a regularity to it it's a it's a protection and a danger uh, the routine can kind of there's, there's good routine and, you know it's a, thank God for habits that you know are going to force us to you know look at the text and uh, 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 at a rigorous level um, but also you that can kind of become customary and you can almost um, you know like you're talking about cranking widgets out of a in a factory, it's like, I just, I just do, I follow this process, and so then, therefore, I'll have a product at the end of the week, every time, um, which is a, which is extremely dangerous, because, um, I, you know, I know, like, like this last week, I'm looking forward to, I, mean, I love this text, it's ministered to me, I, 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 it has so much implication for us as Christians, I'm excited about what it can do in, in the life of GBC, but then I, I just, when it comes right down to it, I know that any insight in, into how does this change the way I would listen to the word is going to start from my practice of how is it changing how I'm listening to the word. <laughs> and so then I'm sitting there staring at, uh, 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 you know, an, an, innate, an innate nature that is awfully good at not listening to the word. And so I have to wrestle that to the ground and I have to think about, okay, and, and, and you know, who, who's ever who's ever perfectly applied a text. And so, you know, when it comes to studying a passage that you're, you're in with a, with, a, with a small group or having a conversation with a friend or if you're teaching a, 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 a Bible study, a small group or a sermon, it's like who's ever actually applied it? You know, who's ever actually, we're always teaching beyond what we've lived. Um, but I, I know that, you know, as I'm looking at my own life and my own heart and things are starting to there's starting to be areas of conviction where i'm seeing oh you know what this is connected to poor listening or here's an area where you might make excuses or here's an area where you're going to actually find ways to think you're a better listener than you are and so i have to kind of start navigating those things um and and then hopefully some of that comes out a little bit in, in as i'm as i'm just dealing with the text but the text is living and the holy spirit is powerful omnipotent and omniscient so if i can get the text right it's not it's not i don't have to walk everybody through my diary of the last four days uh you know it's like there's going to be implications that are beyond what the lord's doing in my heart but if it's not doing something in my heart then then i'm going to be an i'm going to be a um a threat to uh to to the process i'm going to cloud up the articulation so hopefully i'm obeying enough to get out of the way so that the lord will uh, bring that home, that truth home for all of us, so that we can, so that we can benefit from it. So, I guess when you when you're asking, what am I doing when I'm, when I'm studying? I mean, besides all the technical stuff, it's just I want I want to know um, what what needs to be different in my life. What do I need to be practicing to to be a faithful listener to this passage, and um, and then bring some of those implications in a generic way. That's 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 what I'm after. So, John, what kinds of things dull spiritual hearing? For Christians, what categories of things dull our sense of? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting, I, and I listed out several things that can be a distraction, things where we can start to lose discernment, you know, it's some, so beyond some of those things, I, it, well, maybe, if I, if maybe beyond is not the right word, behind all of those things, I think there's, there's a couple foundational principles that, that are critical. Um, number one, if I'm not listening to God's word well, I've got to go back and just ask myself, do I fear the Lord? Um, do I fear the Lord? It, because if you think about what we're doing, it's like we're, we're hearing, I understand, I understand being very casual and very uh, familiar. Uh, you know, if you hear, um, you, you, you hear a, a pastor on Sunday morning or on a Sunday night, there's a routine to it that becomes very casual and familiar and it can be just kind of like, okay, yeah, that's a good sermon. Okay, great point. Yeah, that's an interesting illustration. Okay, good. And we got to step back. We got to make sure we're, we're like, no, if this guy's actually explaining the scripture, God is speaking. And I don't mean that in some sort of weird prophetic inspiration sense. I mean it the way the reformers meant it in the right way. Um, you know, uh, Heinrich Bullinger said, the preaching of the word is the word. Not, not because he was equating it by way, he, wasn't, he was acknowledging differences by way of inspiration, but coming out of a world where they're only hearing preaching in Latin, and now he's preaching in Swiss German and uh, starting here, and people are hearing the word of God in their own language. For him to say that is to say, when you're hearing the Bible explained, you are hearing God speak. And that's exactly right. So avoiding all the weird, you know, inspiration type of infallibility garbage. If a sermon is faithful, we're hearing God speak. We're hearing God speak. So if, I, if that's not making an impact, like, I got to do this, then I got to ask, am I, am I fearing the Lord? And We've, I've done that sometimes privately, and even one time I remember w with my wife, we were, we were reading through some, some psalms, and I just said, yeah, you know what, like, I, I feel like, like I was just kind of struck by how casual this was, and it's a familiar psalm, and whatever, and I said, you know, let's just, whatever it says, we're just going to do. Like, we're going to stop, like, just read the next verse and just keep, and so it's like, we, we just, it was interesting how immediately my reading changed, because it's like, okay, so am I about to confess sin? Am I about to shout for joy with a timbrel and a liar? I don't even have to go find a liar now. I'm, you know, like, I'm just like, we're going to do whatever the psalm says. We're just going to obey. And suddenly there's this attentiveness, like God's speaking. I need to obey this. And um, it just kind of was interesting how it snapped me out of a very casual, just, oh, that's a good psalm. I like this psalm. It's cool. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it's almost that moment where you think, if the author of this text were looking over my shoulder as I read it, and observing how I responded. If I knew the author was doing that, how would I read it differently? Yeah. <laughs> well, he is all the time. <laughs> John, you made a, a, a really interesting observation, and I think you employed Spurgeon to talk about preparation, and no doubt the, the, the preacher, the proclaimer, the discipler, uh, whatever the context is in which someone's handling the word of God, uh, he must prepare. Um, but the, the, the Spurgeon line was something along the line of uh, the, the hearer must prepare even more. Um, how should we as Christians prep for Sundays or prep for a small group interaction or prep for a discipleship meeting, prep for any of those times where the word of God is gonna be opened with other believers or I'm sitting under the teaching of God's word? Um, how do we prep for that? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, number one has to be, well, and this actually connects to, I probably didn't even finish your first question because I was thinking of two principles, um, fearing the Lord, and then number two, just longing for the Lord's instruction and correction. I think there's times where, you know, let me, let me, let me just say this. If, you, if this morning you were hearing Mark 4 and you're hearing Christ charge you to ramp up your standard of how well you listen, and if you walked away thinking, I don't really know what that looks like. I think I do a pretty good job of that. I don't, I'm not sure. If you felt like, kind of like, that's a good charge, but good reminder, good, check. Then I would encourage you, if there's a little bit of complacency in how well you think you listen, I would encourage you to pray. Um, some of the prayers that the, in the Old Testament that are prayed, asking the Lord to stir you up by way of instruction, by way of chastening. A um, couple of examples, let me just give you this. this. This is a prayer that you can pray that certainly will help you um, hear better. Uh, look at Psalm 38 for a second. Uh, 
And, and I think when we see our need, when we see, when we see our sin rightly, and we see our desperate need, then that it, it, it's kind of like it, it, the impossible, uh, it's impossible to kind of d- require somebody who is dying of thirst to be thirsty. You know, when, you, when somebody's dying of thirst and they're walking across the desert and they're, they're about to die, you know, you don't, you don't have to work hard at all to say, hey, you, sh- you really need to be thirsty. They, they're thirsty. They know it. And so when we, when we see our need rightly, we are going to hear the word of God with desperation. This is my lifeline. This is the only hope that I have. And so Psalm 38 is interesting because this is one of those prayers where he's praying for a correction. He's praying for God to correct him. And so if this becomes our prayer, inevitably, we're going to listen better. We're going to listen in a better way. Oh, Lord, rebuke me, not in your wrath, and chasten me, not in your burning anger. And, and you can see the parallel in Psalm 6, verse 1 as well. Those are both um, confession, or, you know, repentant, penitent psalms, penitent psalms as, it, as they're called, seven of them. But it's interesting because the, the, the prayer is actually for the rebuke without the wrath and the chastening without the anger. And that's exactly where we need to be, is to say, oh Lord, you, you, know, you know better than I know how worthy I would be of your anger apart from Christ, because everything about me would be detestable. Uh, but as your child, I, I, just want, I just want your correction, I want your instruction, I want your chastening, whatever it takes, Lord. I don't want there to be any hidden sin. I don't want there to be any presumptuous sin. Test me, try me, see if there's any impure way in me. And you start making that your prayer and asking the Lord to do whatever it takes to make you more like him, he will answer that prayer. He guarantees to answer that prayer because that's in line with his character. It's in line with his name. So another one is Jeremiah 10. Look at Jeremiah 10 for a second. And this is a, an interesting prayer right on the heels of uh, that, that. Let's see. 1023 and 1024, uh, Jeremiah says this, 23, I know the Lord that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. And then look at 24, correct me, O Lord, but with justice, not with your anger or you will bring me to nothing. And so just acknowledging, this is, I'm not asking for justice. We all know what that looks like. I'm asking for a gracious, merciful chastening. Put me in my proper place so that I would hear your word rightly. And um, that's, that'll, that's, a, that's a game changer when it comes to reading the Bible. You know, because then if the Lord is, you know, if you're, if, you're not aware, if you're not aware of where your shortcomings are as a listener, if you're not aware of where the battle lies, if you're, if you're a little bit um, complacent in your own sanctification, then these kind of prayers are going to change the way you hear God speak. So, you know, my hope that my habit is, my, my goal is, is that I would be, Reinforcing John fifteen five every time I'm around the Word. Um, apart from me, you can do nothing. So I think about what I have the capacity for when it comes to my interaction with the Word naturally, and that's a big zero. Um, I have no capacity. I have no ability. And so when I remind myself of that, um, you know, and it, it's then it, it's easy. Like when we're sitting here, we're coming up. You know, we're gonna think, okay, let's just let's talk about the Bible. You know, it's like I was even praying during the song, like, okay, Lord, just help me to glorify you. Um, I don't know, what, I don't know what, what's on people's hearts or minds, but help me just to be faithful and to glorify you and edify people. Um, but there's, there's a lot of areas where if I'm not praying that, that's going to expose a, a real illusion of self, uh, of ability. That's going to expose the real area, like an illusion that I have an ability over here. Um, so over here, okay, good, I see that. But do I see that everywhere? Do I see my dependence on the Lord? And so... You know, if you're, if you're moved, moving into a conversation with a friend, um, like a small group discussion, or uh, a confrontation, or just an attempt to encourage someone, um, you know, we should be readily admitting our, our need for the Lord, and that's going to change the way we interact with His Word and the way we hear. Yeah, and so this will be my last question, then we'll, uh, we'll let Nate walk around with the uh, microphone so you guys can be prepared to be thinking of the questions you'd like to ask. Um, uh, just to make an observation on the, on the last one, I don't know that, that that kind of prayer, thinking through uh, Jeremiah 10 or Psalm 6, um, is, is something that, that comes off best as an afterthought as I'm walking in the front door of Sunday mornings. Um, there, there, there ought to be an anticipation in us leading up to corporate gathering or leading up to time in small group 
um, that gets us out of sort of the consumer mindset that I'm an, I know I'm going to go to church, I know I'm going to be encouraged, I know I'm going to be refreshed, to, oh Lord, please do with me through your word what you would have, and then to be even uh, ready to pray outside of ourselves for all those who will gather. And I'm convinced if we pray for one another for a hearing of God's word at the heart level, week in, week out, as part of our regular, dependent, desperate, not comfortable, but normal prayer uh, as we gather, um, that's, just a, that's just a recipe for all of us to grow. Uh, humble submission to the Lord, where we're meeting each other's needs uh, behind the scenes, uh, pleading with the Lord to, to be at work in us. John, you mentioned this morning um, a great heart disposition that just says, um, obey every word already heard and be ready to obey the words from God that I'm about to hear. That was awesome and hopeless <laughs> simultaneously, <laughs> right? Okay, so uh, maybe we get three expositions on a Sunday. Uh, maybe my small group is working their way through a, a book of the Bible. Uh, maybe I'm leading my kids through family devotions, or I am a kid and I'm hearing the Bible at the table uh, at night or at the bedside or wherever all that happens. Um, and, and then I hear this, okay, I am accountable to apply everything that I've heard. Um, help me with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and, I, and I hope that you didn't walk out of here uh, miserable in the, um, in the sense of like, wow, this is impossible, and uh, I am not listening to another sermon because that's just way too hard. Um, I, I do think it's important when we think about our goal for doing all that God has called us to do, uh, we really got to ask the question, what's our motive? You know, what's our motive when it comes to, to doing that? Because if the goal is to perform, that's, that's, that's abysmal and that's miserable. Um, so, you, you know, when we're, when we're talking about response in God's word, uh, to God's word, excuse me, uh, responding to God's word, the motive has to be, man, Christ is worthy of this. Like, what a privilege. So, sometimes when I see, like, if I think, yeah, like a typical, typical Sunday, we're going to hear um, equipping hour, Sunday morning, Sunday night, uh, then whenever your small group meets, and then maybe you have a midweek Bible study, and then all of your reading and then you open up the Bible with your kids three or four nights a week or whatever it ends up being. I mean, there's, it's just, it starts to, to pile up. And so if all of those things are another performance indicator, it's very exhausting. So if, if, if the more exposure to truth I'm seeing is, is making me more tired, then I've got to ask the question, am I, is this being united with faith? Am I actually believing what the scriptures say, specifically what they say about God and what they say about me. Because if I'm believing God, th this should be like wind in my sails. It should be strengthening me, like run like a young man, you know, wind like the wings of eagles will rise up with strength. So, you know, in an Isaiah 40 and 41 sense, it should be producing all sorts of get after it in this, like an, an, an energetic, like, wow, this is great. Like, look at all this, look at all the ways God can get glory in my life. Uh, I want that. And um, if I'm looking, if it's making me tired, then I'm probably trying to achieve it in such a way that would get John Anderson glory. And God's never going to assist me in that because he's so faithful. He's not interested in helping me in my idolatry. And so he's going to let me just squalor in my exhaustion. Like, wow, this is so hard. And um, so there's an element where it's, it becomes really encouraging if you see exhaustion mounting to be able to repent of trying to do it in the flesh and start moving forward in faith and saying, wow, Lord, look at all this incredible truth, look at all these incredible commands, look at all these incredible promises, look at all these incredible warnings, look at all this revelation of your character, look at all the revelation of my character, and to just take it by faith and, and rejoice in that. So maybe if you walked out of here this morning, if you were feeling that a little bit, like, no, oh, this is just exhausting, then I would encourage you to, to not approach it from a legalistic standpoint of saying, I want, I'm trying to find all these externals that I can meet to make sure that I've fulfilled every sermon that I've heard, because that's where the exhaustion comes from. Um, but you'd be looking at it from a standpoint of, what does this reveal about God? What does it reveal about me? And I, I get the privilege, Lord, Lord, this is so beyond me. 
that when this comes to fruition in my life, you'll get all the glory for it. So help me to move forward in faith uh, to pursue this. And that's just thrilling. I mean, I remember, I remember one time, this is a quick, and, quick little anecdote. Um, I don't know if this is helpful, but it's what came to mind. I remember one, one particular, uh, I think it was a Thursday night, um, I had a late Bible study, uh, got home late, was exhausted, felt, like, felt kind of like I was coming down with something. And I'm just thinking, I just need to go to sleep. You know, as I'm going to bed, I look at my calendar. I'm like, oh, I got a 6 a.m. tomorrow. It's just a few hours away. I feel, it feels like a sore throat. I mean, I, I don't know. I, could, I should just cancel. I'm just miserable. This guy doesn't even, he doesn't even respond anyway. Do I really want to meet with this guy? And this is, you know, and this was not here. This is not at this church, so in case anybody was nervous. Uh, and so I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm trying to rationalize it and justify it. And I just was, what it came down to is I was just tired and I didn't feel good. That's what it came down to. And so I went to bed, I set my alarm, and I just said, Lord, just give me the strength to obey and serve. It doesn't really matter what I feel like. Woke up the next morning, still felt miserable. It just went, because I had planned to, and he was going to be there. And so we went, met at 6 a.m., and I remember, I mean, I'd been meeting with this guy for probably about six months, and, and he, he, had a, he had a particularly difficult posture toward biblical instruction that made it not necessarily a desirable meeting. And in that meeting, after six months, we're six months in of a very regular meeting, we had probably the best conversation where walls were broken down and he started opening up avenues into his marriage that he was previously unwilling to open up and we started making progress. And I went home after the meeting, I still felt miserable. I was exhausted, my sore throat, it was just, I just felt, I was like tired and work. But you, spiritually, it was, un, it was just unreal. It's like, the Lord, you, you are so kind to do something so just like you, like, Lord, to do something like that. And so it was just so sweet to take it on faith and to not say, hey, I'm trying to perform here, but just say, Lord, just get glory somehow, did this miserable, wretched uh, life and body, and I've got human foibles and weaknesses and limitations and tiredness and sickness and uh, everything else. And so, you know, that's just what's so sweet about it. You know, uh, like a command, don't let the word of righteousness depart from your lips. It should always be on your lips. Well, if that suddenly becomes a legalistic, like every time I'm around my kids, I'm talking about a Bible verse, it must come out, and it's, that's just exhausting. But when it becomes a privilege to say, wow, I, I do need to talk. Like, the Bible should be flowing naturally out of my lips. Why, why don't I talk about the Bible more? Why doesn't it come out naturally on the way to football practice, on the way from home from school, on the way? And so it just becomes a, a check to say, well, what's going on in my heart? Lord, I want, you to have, I want you to have all that worship in my heart. I want that to flow out naturally. Um, so that, that's hopefully the goal. So long answer to a short question. Yeah, and sometimes we, we have the response, man, I'm hearing so much truth, so much of the word. I'm accountable to more, and I'm making the list of all the implications that I need to start thinking through and doing. Um, and, and one of the key points we need to be looking for is where is there resistance? Um, and that's a, that's a key feature. If, if, the, if the hearing, if the sensibility is being turned off because I don't like being indicted at this point or another point, that's a significant warning sign of a fundamental spiritual condition. Uh, that's the beginning stages of the Hebrews 3 pathway to apostasy, letting hardness of heart build up. And, uh, and, and so being under lots of truth uh, helps to draw out those areas of our lives where we see areas of potential resistance. But also, I think we just, just have to be careful about a short-sighted view of the Word of God. The answer is not, well, teach less, fewer sermons, I don't want to be under the Word, under account, accountable to so much. Um, if, if we have a short-sighted view of uh, Bible intake, um, we will start to equate, what did I hear this week and how does it apply this week? as opposed to fill your life with the Word of God. You don't know what God has in store for you this week or next year. So you tuck it away in your heart. Um, you, you seek out those areas where it's being resistant, put those to death, and just let the Word of God become part of your DNA, part of the bloodstream. And, and then that is fuel for a lifetime of service to Him in ways you couldn't predict. I think we get in trouble when we open our Bible in the morning, read something, we think, well, this isn't doing anything for me today. At the end of the day, we go, yeah, nothing came out of Deuteronomy 10 in my life today. <laughs> well, you don't know that you're going to need it tomorrow. Just keep reading, keep listening, keep 
breaking down those areas where there's resistance. Um, all right, we need to hear from you guys. Oh, John. Can I say one oh, yeah. quick thing? Because that's, that's a really important point. The, the resistance part, I would encourage you guys to think about your appetite for the word as well. You know, the Psalm 1, 2, right? Blessed is the man who, well, blessed is the man who's not walking the path of the sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers. And, um, but he del his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So when we love the law, when we de delight in the law, when we cherish the law, we have no resistance to more exposition, more Bible. You know, the, the, you know, the, the, it's like the kid who's saying, no, I don't, I don't want a second brownie. I, it just, no, it just doesn't happen, right? It's just we want more truth. And so when I, whenever, I'm, whenever I find myself not wanting more truth, then I know there's something wrong with my appetite. I don't love the word like I ought to. So that's, I'd love to hear even how you, just, how you break, recognize areas where, where's the, where's the um, resistance? How do you recognize where the resistance is when you're listening to the word? Yeah, I, um, anytime there is a, a desire not to hear because there's an implicit desire not to obey, that, that thing where that's going right there is too indicting. That's the battle for the whole life. Right? We, and we tend to compartmentalize and say, you know, I'm great with sound doctrine. I can rattle off five points and five solas. I got the bylaws of Grace Bible Church memorized. But that thing my small group leader said this week about how I need to treat my little brother, ah, we're not going there. I'm, I've got like 98% sound doctrine stuff nailed. Well, you just lost the battle right there. At the, at the one place the word of God indicts you. Uh, you may as well just packaged up the whole thing and put it away. Um, because that is the recipe. As soon as you can compartmentalize and say, that piece of God's voice can't touch my life, um, then you're the sovereign, you're the interpreter, you're the canonizer, right? You've created a canon within the canon, and you've decided what your Bible is. Everything but that little piece. And then whenever it's convenient, you decide the next thing too and you're untouchable, and that's a recipe for a hard heart. So uh, just any point where you sense a dullness, a loss of appetite, I don't want a second brownie, I don't even like brownies, <laughs> um, that's worth confessing. You don't just sit in that loss of appetite and say, well, that's okay, I can be indifferent and ambivalent. God, I don't want to read my Bible this morning. <gasps> Help me want to read my Bible. I want to want to want to read my Bible. Lord, help me. That's a great prayer to pray. Just confess it. It's true. Um, and, and stick with the discipline of reading your Bible when you don't feel like it. Your emotions will catch up. But, but confess the emotion as faulty and ask the Lord to help. All right, Nate, uh, find us a question. Just put your hand up. All right, Carol's got one up here. Mark that would be helpful, or then that's just a simple question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm thinking through my list. I have a stack that I go through. Um, there's, you know, some of my probably the. Mm, I th honestly, you're probably gonna. Your best bet is going to be sermons, you know, sermons from um, trusted um, preachers, you know, and so like even on my phone I have the apps for um, MacArthur, S. Lewis Johnson, and Lloyd-Jones. Um, the, the problem with, now MacArthur's done all of the book of Mark, S. Lewis Johnson you're going to have to have, look at parallels from Matthew because he never did Mark, and then Lloyd-Jones it doesn't have, a, have much on, on Mark, so th that becomes the challenge. So stuff in print that would be a helpful resource. Um, um, certainly the MacArthur Study Bible is a great, great, great tool, great resource just for looking at um, 
uh, textual meaning, looking at some big picture context. Um, so I'm trying to think of like, if you wanted just a, uh, just a, like a classic commentary, um, Mark Horn, he preaches in Oklahoma. He has one called the victory in the, in the book of Mark and it's, it's helpful and it's very succinct. It's a shorter paperback and that's been helpful. That's a, that's a good one. Um, are you it's so funny because as soon as you ask that, I'm, I'm thinking of all these qualifiers. And so it's just like, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, um, I, I want to give a commentary that's just without qualification. And that's starting to get hard the longer I'm in Mark. And, and there's a bigger picture here in, in terms of how, how do we build a useful library for the study of God's word for home. Um, you can use the library that's up here. Uh, by the way, if, you, if you're not aware, you, you're allowed to check out books uh, from the office and, and, or sit up here and pack a lunch and use the library um, and, uh, and, and stop in and ask for pointers. What, what should I be looking for? Um, but when you're dealing with commentaries, a study Bible is a great resource to have. Um, and keep in mind, there are probably three different categories of commentaries. Uh, one would be a technical commentary, which is going to be heavily dependent on the original languages. Uh, and, and a knowledge of Greek and Hebrew is helpful to get through some of those technical commentaries. Another would be something like a devotional commentary, uh, which would be pretty accessible, um, but probably usually aiming more at practical concerns and less concerned with the details of a text. And then you've got somewhere in the middle a, a, a preaching commentary, which essentially is a pastor's sermons on a book, verse by verse, put to print. So as you're looking at commentaries, th those are the kind of spectrum of flavors um, that are available. And then from all ages, I mean, you can go from the, the Reformation forward and find commentaries on all the books. Um, just keep in mind that when you're, when you're looking at commentaries, uh, if, you, if you're looking at a set of commentaries, they're hit and miss with different authors. If you're looking at a favorite author, he's going to be hit and miss because all of those things are secondary to the scripture. They're, in, they're not infallible. Um, and you've got to use discernment. Building a library always means building discernment along with the library. But the best books, whether they're commentaries or other Christian books, are simply discipleship. And the hope is you're finding someone who lived the Christian life well, understood scriptures well, and at the end of a well-lived life, puts some of those things in print and wants to disciple me. Right? That's the way I look at books. And so building a, a commentary library is a, kind of that whole spectrum. Um, and, and Mark's a challenging one. Are you using J.C. Ryle's um, thoughts on the Gospels? Uh, not every week. Um, is that a helpful one in It is in a helpful Mark? one, yeah. That's a good resource, J.C. Ryle. Because basically what he's trying to do is each, each narrative, story by story, he's just explaining it kind of at the level of like, almost like how you would explain it to like junior high or high school. And so it's a very clear, very simple, very readable. Um, it's a great resource. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good one, actually. Matthew Henry is always helpful, but, you know. So talk to me about how uh, the process of writing a commentary on Mark, especially identifying the Mark and sandwich and the structure of Mark that's so critical to all those things. Tell me how that process is going for you, John. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay, Nick's got one. <laughs> By the way, John is being encouraged to write a commentary on Mark. Currently. Well, I hope this falls in the vein of what John preached this morning and what Smed preached, but kind of a question for both of you. In all your study of scripture for many years now, was there a particular passages or verses that was um, challenging or instrumental in your growth, and how did it bless you? Yes. <laughs> yes. You want to go first? You can go first if you got one. Um, it, you know, what's funny when you ask that, Nick, is I think through expositions that I've done, and I mean, I don't know of a book that I've preached that hasn't had such a radical impact. I mean, 
no doubt there's been seasons in my life where my study wasn't what it ought to have been. And I got, I mean, I've never gotten what I should have got out of any exposition ever in the history of preaching, right? It's just, it's never, but the Lord is just so kind and so gracious that, and his word is so living and so powerful. Um, so I hate to even start and answer that question, but I guess some of the things that come to mind, um, uh, preaching, when I, when I first got out of seminary, when I first finished seminary, I was, um, I was doing um, high school ministry and uh, started a college ministry. And so I was, doing, I was teaching about three times a week. And on Wednesday nights, for high school, from eight seniors down to seventh graders, I was preaching Isaiah 40 to 48. And um, it was just a section of scripture that had always compelled me. And it had just... It just floored me, uh, the picture of this incomparable God, you know, the kind, of, the kind of being that is the only being like that, that anything that you would possibly compare to him is an insult. There just does not exist an equal of God. And I'm just like, I was just blown away by that. I'm like, I gotta, these, these students need to see this God. And so I dive into Isaiah 40 to 48, you know, and at that, and my, my Hebrew was so poor, I'd spend all, like eight hours diagramming one passage, you know, just all, all day Monday, I'm just in the, in the Hebrew and just trying to get ready for Wednesday night. And, um, and it just was foundational. It just was, um, just for the, for a view of God that is just, is just unshakable. And I'll just always, I'm just always so grateful for, um, the, the labors of, um, what would that be now? Um, 20 no, six, 17, 17 years ago, just what that did in my own heart. Um, some of the most difficult preaching would probably have been the, the book of Ecclesiastes um, and some of Malachi, but those, and those just had such radical impact on me. Preaching the book of Romans was profound and um, one of those books that just um, constantly, it was, it was unrelenting because I'd read so much about Romans before I preached it and then getting into it, realized that so much of what I read about Romans was just flat out wrong. And it started to, I started to become more and more dissatisfied with traditional interpretations. And I'm just like, look, God knows what he's doing. We gotta figure this out. Like his, his word's clear. Um, and uh, so I just, I just, it just impressed me on God's ability to, to speak. So, and then of course, um, um, probably one of the, my favorite sections we're coming up on actually is Mark eight to 10, because Mark, eight to 10 documents disciples who actually embrace the identity of Jesus as the son of God, but are blinded from some significance of that because of their selfish ambition. And um, I'm actually very looking forward to getting back to that because I think um, when I was going through that 10 years ago, that was one of those sections where um, the Lord was just showing me some, some radical holes in my character um, that had to go. And uh, I'm sure that's gonna be the same. So just really thankful for that. Yeah, Nick, that's such a good question. And, and um, the answer is everyone, every single text. And the, and the pressure cooker of studying in order to articulate accurately God's truth uh, just raises the bar of your attention for the details and the meaning and how it addresses your own heart. Um, so I, I just think most currently, Everything revolves around the book of Daniel. If you ask me a question, the answer's in Daniel. Um, and, and that's true for this one. For a news junkie hanging on every next headline, uh, Daniel is just leveling. Um, because how much, how much time, how much mental energy is spent sorting out the world's problems when there is one solution and it's a big rock careening at this earth that demolishes all the news headlines, makes them obsolete and pointless. Uh, so th that's just a, a current example of where the Word of God addresses where we are. It's as if God knows who we are and what we're like and exactly what we need, and it's challenging in a personal way. Uh, Daniel's challenging to study, and Daniel is studying me, and that's a challenge. And if I just work my way back to the, to the things I've had opportunity to preach and teach, they've all been the same. Part of it is you come to a familiar text, and you can't wait to preach that text and then you get into it and you realize, oh, it doesn't say what I thought it said. <laughs> and it's challenging in that way. It's just always a humbling exercise. 
And, and John was talking about it earlier, you know, the prep for what's required for spiritual hearing. If supernatural work is required for the, for the, the hearer to actually have ears to hear spiritual truth. Categorically, right, the natural man doesn't even appraise spiritual things, but also circumstantially in the Christian life as we grow, we must be yielded in faith, have the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and submit to him to ha let God's word have a hearing. Uh, a life yielded in faith to him is a life driven and filled by the Holy Spirit. We, we need that desperately. And so uh, the preparation in all of that is a preparation for supernatural work. Uh, that's a personal challenge because you just can't come to the next preaching assignment or you think about the next coffee meeting you have with a friend where you're going to open God's word. Um, it's just not automatic that you will clearly give the right answer and a life will change. Um, the, the personal challenge to you in that moment is you actually don't have what it takes. You've got God's word. God's word is living and active and the Holy Spirit indwells, there is a significant supernatural ally in the heart, and yet your attempt to be an instrument in your Redeemer's hands for their benefit is simply at God's disposal. I wanna be faithful, I wanna be true, I wanna be accurate, I wanna make this appeal, I wanna open God's word, and God must do the work, which is just a remarkable enterprise. Uh, whether you're a parent teaching God's word to your kids or you're in a discipleship relationship or a crisis discipleship relationship, you know, we call that counseling, just crisis discipleship. Um, in, in all of those circumstances, um, you are personally challenged with the reality that you can't make spiritual growth happen. That's humbling. Isn't that kind of liberating though, like thinking about how how important, it, like, like, okay, so in Daniel, Smed's, Smed's uh, you know, like that's the longest section of Aramaic in the scriptures. So Smed dives into an Aramaic grammar so he can preach Daniel 2 to 7. Now, that's a high standard of what it means to listen well. But that's, and that's not everybody's standard. Like, that's not, you know, like that's not, what Smed's doing is not necessarily what yeah, you need to do, but that's a high standard, and it, it 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 starts to dispel like seeing what Smed's doing in Daniel starts to dispel some illusions that sometimes we might have that oh okay certain people just have like a spiritual gene, and they have this like magic key to spiritual perception and spiritual maturity almost like almost like physical genetics you know you look at somebody who's like. Man, that dude could be a linebacker in the NFL. Look at his son. He's going to be a linebacker in the NFL. You know, and it's just like, okay, it's genetic. Sometimes we think about that spiritually as if, well, I just didn't get the gene. Wish I could have been discerning. Wish I could have had more spiritual insight. And so you see what a smed's doing in Daniel, and you're like, wow, it's just a ton of work. But look at how it's paying off because he's got a high standard of what it means to listen well, and the Lord's giving him those kind of spiritual insights that are so useful for, for the rest of us. So it's just encouraging when you think about it. Like, it dispels this notion that it's, some magical quotient that we can't put our finger on and some people just have it and some people don't. I hope I get struck with spiritual discernment. That'd be nice. It's a, it's a result of the work we put into listening to God's word. Yeah, that, that just reminds me, John, of, of one of the stories, and I think this is in David Daniel's History of the English Bible, uh, but it's a, uh, a, a Scottish farmer who, when the Bible in his own language, Scots at the time was the, was the dialect, um, was prohibited from owning a Bible in his language, from reading a Bible in his language. Like family devotions at the table were a capital, not capital crime. Well, yeah, at times capital crime. Um, and, and he decided he just wanted his family to understand God's word in their own language. So he worked hard. He had gotten a Wycliffe English Bible, had translated it himself into Scots. This is just a farmer. And he dug out a basement under his house where he could by candlelight in hiding without a view of those who might watch in through the windows, read the Bible to his own family. But that's just a guy. That's not a guy who uh, you know, went off to a, a bunch of school and got a bunch of degrees to be an egghead in an ivory tower. That's just a, a delighting in the word of God and my family needs to hear it. Um, you know, very normal. <laughs> and yet, boy, I, I don't know if I've ever worked that hard um, to, to make sure my family understood God's word. 
Um, and that's just, you know, the desperation of, I know, I know <laughs> that I need the Lord and, and I need his voice in my life. All right, who's got another thought, question? Tanya, the microphone is coming. And you are being recorded. We can hold everything you say against you. <laughs> it's good that it's not about me then. Um, we're putting a loose structure together for homeschooling all the way through high school. If coming out of the regular classroom sh list of classes, if there were specific biographies or courses that you could equip your kids with before you send them out into the world, what are the ones that would just be gems for you to add into the coursework? Okay, did everybody hear the question? Could you hear Tanya? If you were constructing a curriculum for your own kids, imagine you were homeschooling, uh, what courses would you have them take before they got out of your home? What a great question. By the way, uh, don't take the mic away from her yet. D are you doing any that we need to know about? <laughs> Am I teaching them? Yes. Yeah, okay, what, what, what's on your list? Let's start with that. Well, we're not into high school yet. I've cherry picked. We're doing mystery of history right now in a um, grade school level because um, you only have one at home right now. Um, we're doing Shirley English. We're doing all about spelling. We're doing, um, hmm, I'm not happy with math, so I don't know what's going on with math yet. But okay. um, I haven't gotten into strain into all the extras yet. I'm trying to get the course started and then... Yep. I don't want to get to senior year and go, oh, I wish I'd known about or thought about X, Y, Z. Yep. I say uh, English sentence diagramming, New Testament Greek, church history, systematic theology, every book of the Bible as a class. Any, any other ideas, John? <laughs> so some systematics, you know, just as an elective. Yeah. yeah um, you know, it's interesting. That's a great question, Tanya. I, you know, my goal when I was doing, when I was a high school pastor, which is obviously a different, I'm trying to scratch a different itch there. But even, I'm making choices as a pastor. What am I going to bring these students through? And that was before my kids were even at that age. Now my kids are at that age. But even back then, I, I, I thought, well, if I get a typical high school student for four years and we're doing, and they get to hear two expositions a week, what, what is it that they're going to need and, you know, I can't, I, I can't, I'm not going to answer every question in four years, no matter how much time I spend with them. Uh, and, nor, nor, and that's not even, that's just, I'm just a pastor. A, a parent, parent can't even do that. So as a parent, it's like, or a pastor, the, the question then becomes, what's the critical element? And I, I, always, I always went back to, I want these students, even though we can't answer every question, I want them to have such a robustly biblical worldview that they have confidence that they know where they can get the answer to every question. And so when it came to some of the, 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 you know, the, the real touchstone elements, you know, this is before, well before critical race theory, even before um, Oger Obergefell and all that stuff, that was probably even when I started more into the college ministry years. So this is before a lot of the um, LGBT was, uh, and not before it, but just before it became so political, but so politically recognized. But, I mean, there's, everything's at, at, at attacking even the view of scripture and the view, creation and evolution. And so there's these, there's these certain ones that are just touchstone that I wouldn't be faithful uh, to ignore. But I want to give them such biblical confidence, confidence in the scripture to see just how inarguable it is, just how robustly divine it is. That when the Obergefell, which I wouldn't have known when that was going to happen, but when that then comes, and the, that's the, uh, the, the Supreme Court case uh, that legalized um, um, the SCOTUS decision. I don't remember what year that was. But anyway, it was after I was a high school pastor. It's like, I wouldn't have picked, okay, this is going to happen in two years. And, but I want my students, whatever that, whatever that next one happens to be, I want them to have such a robustly the biblical worldview and then confidence that they can know, this is absolutely going to tell me everything I need to know. So now here we are, and we're looking at, the, um, the Canadian um, law that was passed last month went into effect yesterday, I believe. Um, now in Canada, it's illegal to practice conversion therapy. And so anybody who is self-identified in whatever may believe gender they want and somebody tries to convince them back to a cisgender worldview, the traditional two-gender, um, that's conversion therapy. If you practice that, you're, you can get maximum um, fine of up to five years in prison. Um, so 
that's Canada. You know, and so it's like, I think about what that means for our teenagers. Um, you know, are my teenagers going to even be able to start having a family in a church where a pastor could even preach Romans 1 without ending up in prison? You know, so there's just an element of like all these unknowns. It's just not to scare us, but to say, let's be wise and let's try to equip and let's get ahead of it. And, and so I think the, um, you know, the, 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 the way there is just thinking about books that are going to help understand a biblical worldview, a biblical perspective. Um, we had a, um, a, a classical conference, not a classical conference, I don't remember what it was called now. There was a uh, homeschool co-op at our, at our church that I was formerly at, and one of the teachers asked me to teach a section on it, and I grabbed, I grabbed the, some of the assigned material, and these are, you know, these are, I think, 15 to 17-year-olds, I think, basically in this particular class, and they assigned Peter Kreeft. So Peter Kreeft is a Roman Catholic, teaches at Boston College. He's, he's a known apologist. He writes a lot of philosophical worldviews. And so I'm, I'm reading this thing, and I'm, and I'm realizing, man, this is an interesting, that's an interesting assignment for a high school teenager to read Peter Kreeft and to get something that sounds so externally Christian, but yet it's coming from a totally different worldview. And um, so I, I came like kind of loaded for bear. I was like ready to like totally say, hey, guys, let's, let's think about this critically. I just want teenagers to be able to think, okay, so how do I think about, isn't, isn't that right? Shouldn't we think about, I mean, he, the guy's against abortion, so isn't everything he says good? No, let's look at some of these things he's saying. Are these biblical? And so, you know, that's just, that's just a really important part of, you know, those teenage years when they're starting to think for themselves um, to just help them see Man, we are not lacking. When we subject every thought to divine thinking, we don't lack anything. We don't lack any answers. Because whatever answers aren't here are answers we don't need. It is totally sufficient. So that's my non-answer of not telling you what curriculum to use, but just to say how to think about what curriculum to pick, um, thinking about what's going to help your teens understand the sufficiency of Scripture. Did you tell the uh, class that Peter Kreeft was the evangelical who fell off his surfboard, hit his head, came up a universalist Catholic? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> That's a great introduction to this work. Um, you know, the, I, I had some phenomenal classes in high school. I went to 4,000 plus student public high school in Southern California, then one in Texas. And I had a class on scuba diving. I had a class on beach volleyball. I had a class on anatomy and physiology. Um, PE and lunch were the best. Uh, if I were creating a school and the scope and sequence of what to be taught, I, I like some of the best that classical education has to offer. I like a lot of the best things in Western civilization. Those are good. Um, but to take chemistry, for instance, from a biblical worldview makes a worshiper, right? Where you echo the thoughts of Psalm 119. You echo the thoughts of Romans 1. You, you cry out with the rocks in geology class that the Lord is to be praised. Um, and so... At one sense, in, in an education system, you're learning how to think and you're teaching students how to think. It's not just about the information. Part of it is the discipline of using your brain. Part of it is the discipline of discernment. Part of it is the discipline of what John was just talking about, filtering everything through a biblical worldview. And so whether you're, you got kids in public school, private school, charter school, homeschool, whatever it is, parents do have the responsibility of discipling their kids in the, in the worldview filtering everything through the scriptures. Um, but what a, what a delight would it be to um, write the curriculum or assemble the curriculum so that uh, my church history is seen through the lens of truth, my world history is seen through the lens of truth, chemistry and anatomy and physiology and math is seen through the lens of truth. Um, and, and what a great thing for Christians to go after those things. Um, the, the world is losing sight of the value of things like math. <laughs> ironically enough, and, um, and, and, but that's, you know, that, those things are things God created and runs the universe on. Um, how much better to appropriate those from the worldview that said God made these things. They scream out his glory, Psalm 19.1. Um, so, I mean, best to you, I'd love to see what you come up with at the end um, with, the, with the whole curriculum, but um, if you're looking for specific things, I know, that, I know that I put together a list of, if I'm going to hand my kids 10 books before they leave the house, here's that stack of 10 books. And every, every family, every home is going to have a different stack of books. And it's not just books, it's also just bodies of information. 
But whether you're homeschool or any other kind of schooling, you have to be thinking about that as a parent, right? We don't just surrender the, the mind numbing of our kids to whatever passerby has that task at the moment. So great question. Okay, maybe one more. We're 701, but we kind of want to sit here and answer Alan's question. It's been cooking in that noodle for a while. Um, just thinking through what you were saying about um, like 1 Corinthians 9, you know, Paul using his liberty. Um, you know, just thinking even what you're talking about, just not building wood, hay, and stubble, you know, not running without aim. Um, how do you, if you help me think through how to um, see like use of free time or, you know, just, I mean, not like we have a lot, but, you know, just when there is, you know, even the thought of like, well, watching a football game or, or even something else, you know, what's the thought of that? so that it's not just, you know, wood, hay, and stubble. And okay, and let me just make sure I hear your question correctly. Are you asking about how best to use our time, say free time, recreational time, in, in an intentional way? Is that your question? Uh, more so, yeah. Um, or just even like thinking through the mundane things. I mean, obviously we have our priorities of, you know, this is, I'm a believer, and then here I'm a husband, I'm a you know, right. father, but just the, other non-role specific. Yeah, so hypothetically, if not every moment is in my home is level nine spiritual engagement, right? Um, or d does, does, does my home have other things, mundane things, uh, practicing layups or uh, watching a football game? And, and how do you think about those things? Is that, the, is that your question? Yeah. Yeah, no, for us in our home, it's level nine all the time, spiritual stuff. How about you, John? There you go. <laughs> Level 10. <laughs> Go for it. Let's pray. <laughs> That's, great. That's great. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, you know, even this morning when I was thinking about ways that my, that, that my use of time affects my ability to listen to the word, I know there's a radical difference between just things in my life that are really a, a conscientious choice that I enjoy, we enjoy as a family. Like, you know, we, we, we enjoy football. So our family does watch a football game. So if I'm enjoying a football game, and that's something that I share with my family, and that's just part of a, a relationship, and it's in its proper place, and it's not, it's not interfering with any other priority, that could be an okay thing. That can quickly cross over in my mind to something that becomes very selfish if suddenly, you know, oh, the next thing I know, I'm watching football highlights and I'm, you know, so I'm mastering, you know, who's, you know, the, the, here's the NFC playoff picture and, you know, and I get all, and it's like, you know, so suddenly something that was formerly a, an, a, a decision that was useful for family relationships starts to become something that I'm, I'm just doing because I personally want to do it. I found in my own heart that I know that I know that there's a line being crossed when I start feeding the selfish aspect of just feeding what I want to do. And so when it remains in its category of, hey, that's actually enjoyable, because then I'm talking to my boys about that. It's something that we shared together. And instead of just something that I want to do and I isolate and I'm sitting there just vegging out watching football highlights, I, I know that my, my heart is my heart is going quickly. To, to feeding something that's more akin to self-love rather than love of God and, you know, love of looking for eternity and living with my eyes set on, on hope. So I think, you know, I'm just trying to explain that anecdotally. We have to be very, very careful in our conscience to just say, okay, why am I doing this? And why do I want to do this? And sometimes we can become hyper, hyper, uh, you know, evaluate everything and say, well, you know, is... is um, you know, sitting down and reading this story with my kids, is it going to change eternity? Well, maybe not. Maybe it's just an interesting story. Um, but the question that I'm going to be asking is, is it more important than, you know, something that's just gray area, gray area use of time is, am I obeying the Lord? Uh, can, I, can I expose this, my, my thinking, to some story without 
biblical scrutiny. Okay, and now I've crossed the line if I haven't. So I gotta, if I'm going to engage in that, I've got to use biblical scrutiny. Or am I feeding something selfish? Am I opening some, some provision or some sort of, you know, feeding something about personal significance or selfishness or self-love? So we just have to be very careful about our use of time because so often we can look at something that's gray and just, depending on how we want to interpret it, make it good or bad. You know, one guy's going to look at use of time that's a gray area and say, well, that's a waste of time. That didn't contribute to eternity. And the next guy's like, well, who are you questioning my, my, my gray use of time? You know, like, I want to use this, my gray use of time this way. And we, it comes back to a, a well-informed conscience, and we have to know why, why we're interested in that gray area use of time. And I think that's what I'm way more concerned about um, is when I start crossing lines in my own heart doing something that externally there's nothing wrong with, but I know in my own heart it's just, this is just selfish. Uh, then that's, that's where I start getting concerned about my own discipline, my own structure of my life is this ordered with biblical priorities. So. And so and if I'm going to, if I'm going to build a theology of time, enjoyment, recreation, uh, blank spaces in family life, um, what, what John was just talking about in terms of, um, checking idolatries and working everything through um, a biblical grid is really critical. And, and I think you just have to have the book of Ecclesiastes under your belt um, to help build this sort of theology of free time. Um, and and, and it, Ecclesiastes is going to help you rewrite your definition of free time, um, that, that everything echoes into eternity one way or another. But in Ecclesiastes 3, God has apportioned times. They are his times. By the way, Ecclesiastes 3, I know the turtles stole the song. There is a season, turn, turn, turn for everything, you know. Um, and they turned it into, you need to make decisions about when's the best time to kill somebody or when to have world peace, right? They blew it. They were in the 60s. They were hippies, whatever. Um, Solomon's point is not these are your times to figure out, but these are God's times. He's ordered a tapestry of a variety of different kinds of things, from birthday parties to funerals, and they're in his hands. And so he says things like, uh, it's a gift from him if you have things to enjoy and the empowerment from God to enjoy them. That's the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. What a tantalizing, horrible thing if you're given good gifts from God under the sun, but because you're not fearing him, you actually don't have the power to enjoy them for the things that they are. You've made idols out of them. They rob you of the joy that would be in them if you were rightly related to your creator, and instead you're trying to eke out of those things, things they'll never yield. The disappointment of the vanities under the sun will drive your theology of enjoyment in Ecclesiastes to the right things. To, to things like marriage, right? Um, here's this command, enjoy life with the woman whom you love. Uh, l let your life be merry, enjoy that. And, and then you get to Ecclesiastes 11, rejoice young man during your childhood and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. Uh, these are commands and they're appropriate and it comes in the very next verse leading to the thrust and the whole point of Solomon's sermon is, um, and everything's held to account. So, Watch a football game, young man, or whatever it is, um, assuming we do away with the idolatries and the distractions and the things that tear our hearts away from Christ. But know this, everything is accountable before the bar of God's judgment and waits for eternity. So Ecclesiastes 12, the summary of all of it is, remember your creator and know that God brings everything to judgment. The beginning of wisdom is this, fear him. That's the end of the sermon. The beginning of wisdom and the end of Solomon's sermon. Um, you get into a right relationship with your maker. You filter everything through him. You recognize God's not stingy. He's actually given things for us to enjoy under his son. Uh, but the minute we become worshipers of the created thing rather than the creator, Romans 1, uh, then we've actually robbed the good gifts of their ability to bring about the temporal enjoyments that they're capable of. Um, and, and those temporal enjoyments are designed, and I love Calvin's um, take on enjoyments in this life, and this comes out of the Institutes and his sermon on meditations on the future life. And he says, if there are jo enjoyable things in life, remember that these are pre-minders of what is to come in eternity. That God is a giver of good gifts, and he's, in, he's designed enjoyment for his people. So enjoy a good meal, enjoy an enjoyable relationship, uh, enjoy the things that God gives, and know that they are a foretaste of a good God who longs to give his children good things in eternity. 
And when trials come, let these remind you that this isn't your home. Trials are normal here. Difficulties are the norm. Don't put all your eggs in the basket of trying to get enjoyment here. It's not for here. Let the trials remind you that this is not where it is. It's in heaven. So, you know, you, you, you get the, the it, it's easy to fall off on one side or the other, to have a sort of artificial spirituality that makes God stingy and discounts all enjoyment and makes life miserable for your kids at home. <laughs> or, or the other side of things that makes idols out of every recreational opportunity. And, and look, those are, those are um, common graces that the Lord gives to everybody under the sun. Um, and if you let them be out of proportion to what God has designed them to be, you will become an idolater. You will be disappointed. You'll end up chasing the enjoyment for the enjoyment's sake and miss God and the enjoyment. So just let them sit where they're supposed to be. Memorize Ecclesiastes and build a theology of fun. Yeah, we used to say, we used to say there's no such thing as... Um uh, a non-Christian properly enjoying a powder day. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it's just superficial. It, it's just, uh, it's ephemeral. It's, it's really fun for a short amount of time, and the, on, the, the idolater can only enjoy it for a superficial reason. And You're talking God, about a powder day to Arizonans. Are we talking about powdered sugar? Oh, yeah, powder, powder. No, man, I, I've been to Snowball. I mean, you guys have some good snow. Powder day. I'm talking about, sorry, everybody's like, oh, okay. Ski. Powder day, yeah. Sorry. I like, I'm just kind of surveying like the, as the response there. That was good. That was helpful. <laughs> but I mean, I love, I'm, I'm so glad you brought it back to Ecclesiastes because that's hardwired into all of those enjoyments. You know, Alan, we think about the stuff we could devote to our, our time to. If that's to satisfy, it's all broken, right? So we're, you know, he, he plays Jeopardy, right? Where, where can advantage found, be found for, for man's soul? Where can you find an advantage, a gain, well, if you limit your search to everything under the sun, it's, it's all vanity. It's meaningless. So when those things that we would devote our time to become the focus, like the idolatry, it's just broken and it's empty. Um, but when you're worshiping God, whatever he grants you to enjoy can be enjoyed properly. And that's just, I'm, I'm so glad you took that back to Ecclesiastes. Thanks, man. John, why don't you uh, close this yeah. in prayer? We'll dismiss and fellowship. Father, thank you so much for this uh, time where we can just discuss your word and we can discuss how we listen and we can just discuss these topics that are on our minds. And thank you so much for giving us a sufficient word that has answers for everything. And uh, so thank you, so thankful, Lord, for this body that is hungry, wants to grow, wants to become more like you. And we have infinite resources because of your grace. Your grace is infinite. Um, your, your mercy surpasses all of our sin. The, the depth of your revelation is enough to show us the, your incomprehensible nature and your, 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 your knowable greatness, but it's beyond comprehending. And so thank you for making yourself known so that we might be humbled before you. And so tonight, Lord, as we close our time, I just pray that these discussions that we've had, that they would be useful for our hearts. I pray that we would chew on them, meditate on them, that we would love your truth to such a degree that we would want to think on them and consider them and, and live them out in our lives. Some of these truths are just things that become part of our framework and our worldview and they become something that we think on. Some of these texts are, are things that we're going to pray. Some of these texts are things that we're going to actually do and practice. And so whatever, the, whatever text we've, we're thinking on, Lord, if it's a command, give us grace to obey. If it's a warning, give us grace to heed. If it's a promise, give us grace to believe it. And um, we just thank you so much for uh, such an incredible Lord's Day that you've given us together. Thank you for the grace that you've shown us as a congregation on this particular Lord's Day. In your name we pray. Amen.